Well, thank you, Christine, first of all. Um, I have to say that I'm really uh, happy today because like the stars are you know, in a line because I have the pleasure to have here in this room my three advisors, one from Berkeley, which was Christine, one from Davis, which is Dr. Stephen Brash, and one from Argentina, which is Mariette Albeck. So it's kind of, oh, look, I'm here talking to them right now. So I returned to Berkeley and especially to ARF uh, after 15 years. This was my, my home for a while. And I want to uh, especially uh, acknowledge and, and say thank you to the Center of Latin American Studies, to the Department of Anthropology, and the Archaeological Reserve Facility, the ARF of, uh, here. So because uh, with the work of them all together, is, it was possible for me to come to talk for you. I want also to say thank you for you to, to be here sitting and sharing knowledge because I think it's very important for all of us to know what is going on in different parts of the world. So um, this is part of my work. Uh, as Christine said, I, I work more on field archaeology like uh, on early agricultural systems. But having that in mind, you will understand why I had to go in, through these issues, uh, almost like, some, like something I really have to do to continue working as an archaeologist. So this has both sides. I'm interested in this, and also it's kind of very important in Argentina to do this kind of outreach work too. Um, let me see. So we often find people in Argentina reacting to disconnect contemporary indigenous communities from their past, either through arguing for an absence of true continuity or by accepting the denial as part of a package on how to deal with the present. There is indeed a retreat from theory, but we argue that heritage needs to find alternative models or ways of thinking that can find in the fluidity of identity building, an inspiration for practice rather than a source of anxiety. I will share some of the ideas of past and present as a whole lived space we have achieved from the experience of intercultural management and some of the difficulties we have encountered in terms of developing policies for land and heritage in collaboration with indigenous communities making ownership reclaims. In this experience, I share the making and struggling, especially the struggling too, with my dear colleagues from Argentina, Marisa Lazari, Patricia Arenas, Jorgelina Garcia Carate, Marcos Quesada, Mariana Maloberti, Carlos Achero, Ingrid Aguilar Villacorta, among many others. It's very important because all this research is collaborative. Our results reveal the multiple tensions that can exist in relation to ethnic identity claims where the legitimacy of this is questioned by some local landowners as well as the provincial government due to, due to their interest in resources, tourism, heritage, etc. So let's see a little bit what's going on in Argentina and how do we arrive to this situation. The Spaniard invasion in America meant for the indigenous societies of northwestern Argentina the extermination of indigenous people that opposed the invasion and domination over their ter territories. One of the most dramatic cases involved the forced relocation of the survivors of the organized resistance led by the population of Quilmes in the Calchaquí Valley, uh, 16,000 kilometer, 16, kilometers south, their native labs, and they were um, taken to the banks of the Rio de la Plata, to the sea. In other areas, the arrival, the arrival of Spaniards was later. But in all cases, in northwestern Argentina, the consequences of the conquest were the same. The loss of their communal rights, the loss of their languages, most of them with no record at all, and the loss of their lands. And with the time, the loss of their proudest indigenous peoples, since they were forced to recognize themselves as not descendant of them, but as of criollos, which is uh, mestizo, mixed. Uh, indigenous travels, 
Indigenous struggles for recognition have long been present in Argentina, at least from 1968, particularly in, conne in connection with the land claims and basic civil and human rights. Cultural heritage and environmental issues have increasingly become the focal point of many claims. While they have been actively struggling for their rights before 1994, constitutional reform in Argentina was in that date, um, was that pos the, the, the situation that gave them the possibility to, to claim for their rights with more force. Um, so communities up until now were invisible or presumed extinguished and now sprouted the country as a consequence of the occurrence of this reform with various political and economical processes. While the centuries of colonial control over the violent military campaigns and assimilation policies of the Argentinian Republic in the 19th and early 20th century undoubtedly left their marks, native people found a variety of ways for weaving regional and local identities based on diverse logics over the time. The confluence of factors multiplied the unprecedented levels of events that space for indigenous cultural and political intervention in the political sphere. Many voices have quickly loved the phenomenon as a reinvention of tradition, a label that seeks to cast a shadow of doubt over the authenticity of this current process of culture making. Such arguments are countered by the fact that the apparent previous disappearance and thus contemporary re-emergence cannot be understood without reflecting the long process of assimilation of the indigenous population into the Argentinian nation that resulted in an homogenized peasantry or urban working class that turned self-recognition into shame. This resourcefulness has been a creative force against the discourse that supported conqueror governance practices. Discourses that now have been called upon to sustain new orders of political and economical domination. Like others, we, this group of people you have seen, are concerned with the role of archaeology as a potential tributary for such abrasive ideologies. Archaeology can do, do, can do this in two ways. One, as like by perpetuate, perpetuate, perpetuating analytical modes that emphasize the discontinuity between past and present. Or the second possibility is promoting frameworks that accentuate, romanticize, and ultimately essentialize notions of local and particular identities. Despite their differences, these strategies may have similar results of the othering that is denying the political agency of people, both in the past and in the present. <coughs> Dominant discourses seek proof to deny indigenous rights in the prehistory and history of the region. Characterized by a rich palimpsest of mob mobilities and cultural mixings. This in turn forces indigenous communities to deploy the role of such practices in their own becoming. So a symbolic trap has been created. One symbolic trap that those subject to it cannot live without harm. Um, Criticism of ethnocentric practices in the social sciences have been aimed especially in the fields of anthropology and archaeology. Archaeology reoriented the practices, adapting to hybrid research environments and responding to unsatisfied societal demands. It, therefore, has had its knowledge restructured with new questions, assumptions and new responses too. Under these circumstances, where research problems have moved beyond the material culture of the past, it is also important to point out that the authoritative status of archaeology and anthropological discourses have become disturbed. We argue, as archaeologists, for a new interpretative framework that matches this complexity. 
we perhaps depart from others in our insistence to integrate the past and the present in equal terms. That is, beyond the usual preoccupation with the malleability of the past and its constitution into the present. We understand past-present to be a system of equal terms of value. And we argue that the locations where heritage struggles emerge are social, semantical, and physical spaces of ontological multiplicity where these systems become live in the flesh realities of a people. The past is not only a resource in a strategic argument, and despite the multiplicity of its meaning, it has a weight that becomes more real, more unavoidable through the gra gravitational pull of particular places and things. Uh, in Argentina, new discriminatory discourses are established along the lines of being or not being white even when the definition of whiteness is quite complicated matter in the, long, in the light of the long history of migrations and mixings that had shaped the nation. Such logics permeate field encounters in situations marked by heritage struggles. We, academic, urban dwellers, non-rural non -rural residents, etc., are categorized by them as the white ones, as much as we categorize them as the indigenous or campesinos, peasants, who, by the way, often prefer to come themselves in many other ways, such as indio, originario, comunero, no indio, etc., that are not political correct, but that's why how they like to be called, depending on the fluctuation status of collaborations. These mutual classifications tend to flow along a continuum where visible markers are indicative of the level of alignment between perceived different goals. In order to think and analyze the production of identity images from within these territories, we follow Brazilian anthropologist Cardoso de Oliveira, who believe that ethnic identities are constructed as a result of an ideological structuration of the collective representations derived from the diet and contrastic relationship between ourselves and the others. This means that the theory of ethnic identity requires hermeneutic approximations and the authentication of observations and questions. So, the explicit discourse of identity is made visible when the behavior that it involves becomes visible. We need to see. This does not imply that the discursive aspects are not legitimate in themselves, but narratives cannot be understood except within the context that produces them. That identities are fluid and performative without being elective is now a well-established action in the social sciences and humanities. Yet, in the field encounters that happen around heritage claims, other understandings that see identity as inalienable <laughs> and not transit tend to dominate. Many have noted how the more nuanced understanding of identity that circulates widely in academia do not seem op to operate in heritage struggles, particularly in those claiming rights face a legal and political order that continues to operate according to a positivistic definitions of identity and descendant. Subaltern subjects need to form themselves into the way they need to be in order recognize that's the consequence it is therefore unsurprising then that more nuanced and open understandings fall or sorry fail to capture the imagination of people however particular this logic may be it shares the fetish more that characterizes many similar encounters across the globe as well as many other encounters within and across interpretative communities of various kinds, in our context in particular, where there's a battle between social imaginaries. On one hand, those who see indigenous reemergence as a danger to the region or nation and find an excuse in the long-term hybridities for their attacks against indigenous rights. And on the other hand, the same evidence 
therefore, becomes a source of anxiety to those seeking recognition. The source of our exploration, however, is not abstract, but grows organically from the very landscape we inhabit as practitioners. The Earless Hunter Gather societies circulated across huge distances, and their toolkit proves a wide and diverse range of places and resources they had access to. This wide spatial research characterizes the whole of the prehistory of the region, as people continually rely on these ancient roads and knowledge based through the increasingly complex socio-political orders that characterize it later periods. Later on, both Incas and Spaniards relocated people massively across the region as part of the dominance strategies. This knowledge turned out to be extremely useful to counter taxation and other restrictions imposed by the Spaniards who copiers. People travel for all sorts of places and from all sorts of reasons, from arguing legal cases at royal audiencias or courts to being uh, apprentices in medicinal practices, which Spaniards judged by sorcery. And by the 19th century, with the dawn of the New Republic, migrations took place due to the war and work. Example, labor for haciendas in Salta came largely from Bolivia. While the rural communities' trade networks continued, albeit around new centers and resources provided by the developing markets. This fluid, permeably, and constantly reassembled life world continues today. People have complicated lives, and many have found their indigenous activist voice quite far from the birthplaces, especially from in the cities. When they go to study in the cities, they start to be activists in indigenous rights. So we would like to explore the past as a lived, inhabited reality through a series of examples of communal or familiar museums in northwestern Argentina. Hopefully, we will succeed in showing the adequacy of this approach to engaging with this emerging scenario more fruitfully, attending to our own misaligned expectations of what communities are and how they should look like. We begin this assumption with an horizontally organized work that there is an utopia that guides us. In our case, we have taken the construction of an authentic type or intercultural work as our utopia, in the sense of a guide to give our force direction. According to Garcia Canclini, utopias of change and justice can in this way be made to articulate with the cultural studies project not as a prescription for how we must select and organize the data, but a stimulus to investigate the real conditions under which reality can cease being a repetition of inequality and discrimination and instead become a situation where the others are recognized. Um, this is an empowerment process. So, and principally, they are the actors of this social inclusion. So it's their construction and their experience. We, the university people, the academic people, accompany them through heritage and cultural reclamations. But we maintain our identity as social scientists. And we agree or disagree just as, we, as any other stakeholders. So the social, political, and cultural settings within which community members carry on daily lives, lives are cross-cut by the interests that can turn a community into a highly conflicted territory. And that is what gives us anxiety to us. Competing interests, including agencies from the various branches of Argentina and national governments, NGOs, the community themselves, and those who claim to hold land ownership titles, produce a variety of images that can either legitimize or deslegitimize a community status as native people. 
These discourses operate on the relations among the various parties involved in politics that are generated above all of those that cause the same communities to be constituted as legal entities through the claims of territories. So, while we have been with uh, some successful experiences of coordinated efforts toward cultural heritage management and preservation in Argentina, we have to say that the country remains far away from the many places in the world that have pioneered these approaches. So in 207, the Institute of Archaeology and Museum, where I work, together with the Indian community of Quilmes, the, the ones that I showed that they have this very big struggle in Spaniards' time, organized the first community and university cultural management meeting. The workshop was organized in order to create a space of interaction, dialogue, and collective reflection between cultural producers and managers from diverse contexts, communal, indigenous or not, academic, official bodies, etc. The main goal was to know local aspirations toward cultural heritage, of which the sacred city of Quilmes one, was one of the many examples. Invitations were extended to all the indigenous communities of the Calchaquí Valleys, today aggregated in what has been called the Calchaquí Union. The Quilmes Cultural Center was selected as a meeting place due to availability and logistics. This is the place. On the archaeology side, the idea of the workshop was to set the foundations for a dialogical approach to cultural heritage. This means that rather than acting according to the pre-established principles of good practice, we intended to find ways to build those principles from the ground up, draw through, through contextualized practice and open communication. The particular landscape of northwestern Argentina, which has facilitated encounters and exchanges since the earliest human occupations, prompted this approach as all participants have been profoundly shaped through experiencing it, either as part of it or professional in their daily task. After two days, of intense conversation and exchanges, several areas of concern were identified, such as heritage and mining, environmental pollution and degradation, cultural and adventure tourism, the accepted limits for research, and exhibition of cultural artifacts, among many others. I'm not going to go on. All. This is a short list. It was a big, big document. So just to know that this was going on. Uh -huh. In this sense, although identity is also materialized through heritage, is that not cease to be a point of tension. In fact, there are various ways of referring to it, with the most classic beginning those that enter into clear contradiction with these ideas of identity being constructed via collective representations, since they make reference to heritage as a static inheritance belonging to a community. However, for heritage to be constituted as such, it must be activated. This, are, this is equivalent to articulation of a discourse that will later be supported by various references with which we will make upon this ideological aspect, neither neutral nor innocent, which plus another fields of interest are getting into play. So the reality that is that up until now, who has been responsible? Who has been responsible for this activation? Is a question, and the answer to this question is that national government and the scientific fields are the ones that activated heritage. So the determining factor for the concept it is symbolic nature and its ability to symbolically represent an identity. But since it has materially, materially, it has it. Uh, it is not uncommon for actions involving appropriation, substitution, or destruction to occur. So taking these two concepts as a starting point, 
construction and symbolic nature, we can now articulate our experiences of working together with the communities. From our perspective, we can say that heritage has been constructed in the same manner as ethnic identity, in the sense that is the result of an elaboration to differentiate between ourselves and the others, or perhaps better, put between what we have and what they have, and what we distinguish us from them. Nevertheless, this heritage, this heritage, typically defined as collective in nature and intention with the outside, must take root, must have continuity, and must enjoy a minimum degree of consensus in order to constitute itself as such to become an established over time. So this complex process finds its material form in the territory. When we refer to territory, we do so while taking into account its social construction. In other words, the distinct ways in which the space is appropriated by a various of actors. Culture, memory, historical process and conflicts are all part of the tensions uh, projected towards the inside of the territory itself. Although the territory remains a material place with its geography, its physical environment, and its natural or cultural resources, it is also a social product, a lived space. In the case of indigenous communities, a variety of territorialities are constructed from various portions and superimposed, sometimes under circumstances that are antagonistic and constantly tense. The territory is valued by the communities and claimed in exclusively supported by material and non-material links to ancestral knowledge. The discourses centered on the lack of legitimacy, legitimacy and identity enrollment system for members of the indigenous communities are made manifest through the granting of a status of a legal entity. This shows the complex situations that territory gives. So the problem seems to be that for some people, the criteria upon which the legitimacy or indigenous communities is based should be verifiable, verif verificable, verif verifiable through the application of scientific methods and not through a process of cultural self-enrollment or by means of cultural genealogy. Instead, they want the Indians to show their credentials of authenticity. This lack of consensus of the criteria that should be used to define the Indians produces conflicts that, the, that end up in the local media. Both in articles are in comments from readers. In terms of the formation of legal entities, the national government is criticized for its inability to resolve questions of who is legitimate and who is not. All of this call us into question uh, of the historical, social, and biological uh, continuity with the nation state, which has operated by distinguishing the indigenous plundering, their remains, and suppressing, su su suppressing their identities, and converting their material and symbolical cultural heritage into the object of scientific study by archaeology and anthropology, but not with without first converting them into men and women without history, in the sense of Eric Wolf. In direct contrast with the idea of using archaeological heritage merrily as a discursive tool, Karasik, oh, Karasik documented the legitimacy of heritage claims long before indigenous organizations would make such demands from themselves. Already in the comments of archaeologists who carried out excavations in the early 19th century, this author observed that in the text from the first decades of the 20th century, as well as 1940s, difficulties in the anthropological work linked with their presence were already being reported. These authors note the reticence shown by the locals towards working on the archaeological sites, towards touching the remains, towards going into certain areas associated with their ancestors, 
or towards providing information about archaeological sites, all of this as a resistance against external intervention in their territories. So, an, inter an intercultural and horizontal action probably only has a real contradiction. I don't know what goes on. That comes out from the construction of knowledge. It is true that we humans construct our present from logical for from formal logic. Although also some more esoteric thoughts not openly assume, such as mystical beliefs, science, horoscopes, etc., are among us. But then the instruments of management and access to fund fundings are designed exclusively from the perspective of former logic. The scientific tradition and technocracy, it's on that. So part of the problems is rooted in the fact that in general, rural peoples tend to devaluate their own knowledge. And this devaluation is rooted in certain human sectors. So, uh, um, so it's very difficult to construct this horizontal knowledge and work together as equals when all the fundings and all the possibilities to, to get some projects are based on academic logic. So social domination is based upon inequalities in the distribution of certain types of capital, cultural, technical, symbolic, and informational. Information. We discover through this, this uh, process of working with the communities and that there were other groups working in the same way in Latin America. So sharing experiences and knowledge with the colleagues from ECU museums and other communitary museums in Brazil and Mexico principally, we agreed that there's a chance for a museology of liberation. That is to say, a museology without material heritage, but based on people's right, identification and identity, popular aesthetics and their own dreams. Most of them are not the romantic dreams of the past that other people dream for them. Therefore, we do not tell them what to do. As equals, we make agreements to get together in dialogue, without paternalism, sharing and poison ideas, experiences and desires about heritage and social justice. So, Going to the point of uh, the experience, I'm involved as a coordinator with the museum, the rural museum, the Museo Rural Comunitario in El Bolson Valley, which started as a loosely conceived idea shared by archaeologists and local residents. Um, in 2007, this idea became a reality following a collective community decision to build a museum. But this was this slide who, that's the, that was done by the museologist of the team that made me completely mad. I mean, when I saw that she was drawing this, I started to think we are doing something wrong, also in this way. Because the actual design of, well, the actual design of the building of the museum was chosen by the town's major, following, that another, following the idea of another communitary museum that is nearby, that was decided by an architect and directed by an archaeologist. So, all the time, us. While the choice was certainly a surprising development for the researchers involved in my team and the archaeological team, then we said, okay, the, the museum is already set, people is going to have a museum, we do not agree with the idea of how they, I'm going to show this slide a little bit, oh, oh, it's not this, this one, okay. We do not agree with this kind of building in, in the rural community, but it was already done. So what we did is applied for an international grant, which enabled the collaborative task of deciding the museum contents, and opened new doors in terms of questioning the archaeologist's, the archaeologist's role in such a process and the expectations that both communities and archaeologists maintain. Among other aspects, the process was indeed revealing that many ways in which, in which popular aesthetics may be undermining. Yet, it has also shown how they can return a full force with the motivation for the exhibition project when they 
come to their own uh, ideas. So again, going to this, one of the main challenges faced in the museum project at El Bolson was how to avoid the imposition of such codes. However, this refusal to impose was often met with the resistant researchers often pushed to exercise their aesthetics knowledge. One of the main problems with collaborative work emerges here as well. To what extent can we really comprehend the sensory and cognitive universe of the other, particularly since this other is not a removed and romanticized community, but a loose assemblage of actors that fluidly includes and expert us through a very process of existence? So we started to think about these ideas and we found that back in the 70s, uh, Rodolfo Kusch, who is an Argentinian philosopher, examined the relationship with popular aesthetics in the Americas, particularly in terms of rejection. He, the, word, the Spanish word is repulsión, like that. That any, anything American is caused among the elite and those immigrant descendants. With heightened sensorial language, Kush wrote of the stench of the Americas, the edor is the word again, as the bodily correlates of an underlining anguish that sustained perfection at the expense of imperfection, an irritation caused, caused by the absence of formal balance. The amorphous, as opposed to the finish, the complete and the balance was rejected and feared, as it was signaling the overturning of he hegemonic power. This resonates with Bourdieu's analysis of working class aesthetics in France, which reveal how schemes of appreciation among working class people were those of life itself. Form and function were not separated and the aesthetics deposition was not separating from the practical one. Popular aesthetics were described as based upon the continuity between art and life and by the subordination of form to function. Yet the appreciation of form and materials can be decoupled from the function in such settings. On many occasions, we have found that rural residents have built concrete walls at the front of their houses or around them for no other reason than the joy produced by being surrounded by a different modern material that sharply contrasts with the more common local ones such as stone or adobe. So museums' aesthetics are indeed one of the key battlegrounds in heritage management efforts. The display of artifact as text can be decoded visually, as well as widely available conception of museums' aesthetics, such as those usually seen in association with UNESCO developments, that tends to give a uniform, valuable aesthetics. This become to the facto style of a choice for museums, even community-oriented ones. We often find this to be the norm in northwestern Argentina as well, as the content of exhibitions tend to be produced by the communities, while the design of the exhibition, the displays, the color schemes, the sizes and numbers of active arts displayed, modes of arrangement, media, etc., is decided by museum experts based at national or provincial institutions. As in other parts of the world, local criteria for defining and organizing what is being selected for exhibition are at best re-signified through stylized appropriations of motives and media from local art forms and at worst blatantly ignored. So we are going to travel now to these valleys. This aesthetic sense was also apparent in the El Bolson during community organized trade fair in which an archaeological artifact was curated and exhibited, ex exhibited as heritage for the first time in the area. So, this one. 
So this is, this is a fair. I mean, you can see uh, behind that they are showing their uh, all the displaying all the foods and things that they want to share because it's a sharing uh, feria. And uh, for the first time, they put this object. Uh, the unexpected appearance of this artifact in this particular setting prompted consultants from Argentina's National Agricultural Agency, the, what's called INTA, so it's the people that goes to help with agricultural stuff, to comment on the positive influence that archaeological workshops and other outreach activities have had in the area. However, the display of this artifact signal a greater departure. The exhibit port, while valued as heritage, was also displayed as a vase holding flowers. And thus, it was fully inserted into a new use life context. The banner accompanying the pot show a full biography of the artifact, including all previous known owners and its current status, but its personal property. We have to say that we have nothing to do with this object put it there. It was their idea, we were not in that fair. I mean, it just appeared. But it, it was also a, a, straight, a, 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 fuerte, a strong point for us. I mean, first, that exhibition that I show you, that uh, the museologist put a beautiful museum for this locality. And we said, uh-uh, something is wrong with this. And then this was the positive one. We said, look, I mean, they're not only showing an artifact. They're putting this artifact in life again, in life context, with these flowers. This is a vessel for cooking. And there they put it with flowers and showing the idea of it was ancient, but they are it's still in use. Um, so the appreciation for things in the limb context became palpable when the contact and design of the Community Museum exhibition had to be decided. We made this big project, I told you, and we had to decide all, everything, but principally what they wanted to put in their museum. We said, it's your museum. If you want to put uh, the story of your um, football team, it's your museum of a football team. If you want to put the story of a good a singer of the place, whatever you want, just show you, your community, other communities, tourists, and all the people, what you want to show from your community. So this appreciation for things in the living context became palpable when the context and design of the community museum exhibition had to be decided. The decision of what was going to be in the thematic of the museum were part of a community research process. No archaeological vessel or object was going to be shown in it. Um, not even the archaeological research we have done for 20 years was going to be part of a museum. And we are the archaeologists working and helping with the museum. Nothing for that. But when arriving to, to, uh, to see how they were going to show the things, the community expected that academics would make both the aesthetic codes, the aesthetic choices, sorry, and the choices released to the content, leaving only the organization logistic to them. When it became clear that this was not going to be the case, a first moment of, co of collective disorientation gave way to blossoming of suggestions of colors, textures, objects, and overall layout that were seen as closer to their internal feelings. So, for us, the resulting choices were very far removed from anything that would have been selected by archaeologists and other professionals, not only in terms of colors and displays, arrangement, but also in the terms used to name particular objects and the narratives that accompany them on the display. But we work and work, we have been working a long time. So the question is not uh, one of deciding between Western or non-Western models of museums' aesthetics but one focus on how we can understand community-driven museum practices as existentially and politically meaningful. 
Museums are conceived as vaults, spaces removed from quotidian space, where collective is an expression of collective desire. In praxis, has become own poesis. Community museums embody the contradictory situation as expectations of re-emerging communities across the landscape to find their own representational language when all language has been extirpated, but also to partake in the elements that materials that they can carry from on forward. In, the context, in this context, maintaining our version of the local, I think it was this one, yeah, uh, even that claims to be more attuned of life worth of the people is an imposition. Our horror at the seeing concrete walls in rural cities is just another manifestation of the stench of popular aesthetics that Kush denounced. So capturing the desires of the majority of a community is also an utopian dream not only because the collective desires behind museum projects do not have homogeneous and clearly defined community of others that support them, but also because our desires are part and parcel of the fiction that help to build through our practices. So what I'm going to show briefly are some photos of uh, the current exhibition that was made by the community. Well, they chose everything, the colors, what to show, how to show it, where to show it. I mean, it's an, their own exhibition. And fine, the, the building, no. The building is the one made by the major with other aesthetics. But finally, even if at, at the initial times we feel this stench that Kush talks, Finally, it's really what we can see like uh, something that gives pleasure also to us, you know? So we, we were all happy with this. They, they made also these maquettes. They decided they want to show those houses. This is the fogon, the hearth, where they put things of their uh, abuelos and grandparents. And we made a, a um, lot of work in, 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 in workshops. You know, we don't call uh, them, this, these meetings, we don't call them capacitaciones, capacitations, because it's really an interactive uh, dialogue. And they were on oral history and heritage documentations. Local people were going house to house to see what they think they want to show in the museum and they make a register. This is, this is by law, we have to do that if we want to exhibit. So we have these national forms that we have to fill and they learn how to do it and they understood why. So everything was recorded. Then, we, then they were, oh. Okay, the, I don't know why the photos don't come. Uh, we made also some um, preparation on how to talk, but we didn't give them the ideas of what they have to say, just some sim simple situations, but the speech is theirs. And also for the inauguration, for the first time we had to do this, which is in, in, our, in our aesthetics, but then they started to do these uh, uh, flyers, are done by them, they show the photos, they put what they want to say. Also, there was some training in audiovisual resources and they, they went house to house uh, making uh, stories with the grandparents. And finally, they decided they want to show something in the museum and it's uh, um, workshops they have been doing and also the tasks that people do at their homes they learn how to use all of this stuff, which is not complicated at all, and they took it easily. They also wanted, all these are things that they wanted to do. I mean, we have to do, but uh, they also wanted to do some path or senderos for visitors and for scholars to show different parts of the landscape and the culture and the oldest things of the city and the ways of doing and cooking that they are still on, but more and more are disappearing. And they also asked us, they wanted to have a community library. So we started helping them, but now it's very widely used by the scholars. And this was also very interesting. They wanted to do a, a, what they call a shusheria. Shusho is a wild, a wild plant. 
So they want to, to make a collection of their wild plants and to grow them in a conservative way. So we said, okay, we can help with that too. So this was the case until here of the Museum of El Bolsón where I'm working as a coordinator, uh, just uh, um, following their ideas and their, uh, and their issues. And uh, as we will see at the end, I think this was uh, something I, I couldn't avoid to do if I wanted to be an archaeologist in that place. Now it's what I really like to do. I mean, I don't like phytoliths anymore. I want to do this. <laughs> but phytoliths are the ones that feed me, so. Uh, but there are other experiences I'm going to briefly show you um, from other uh, archaeological teams. And uh, what I want to, s to show you is the difference on, on management. This is, this is really interesting. This is a family uh, running a museum. It is in Antofagasta de la Sierra, which is already in the Puna in the highlands. And this is our archaeological team. So they decided they, want to, they wanted to have a museum for the tourists. It's not for the community, nor for the school uh, children. It's for the tourists. So, uh, they, they had the idea and the archaeologists did the museum. Okay, that's a different way. But it's a family running this museum, made also the, well, as you see, the house is more similar to their local houses. So in this way, I think they were really brilliant. And then this is the family. This is the old uh, um, grandfather of a family. And the way they, they show it and also the text is very, very archaeological. I mean, I, I think they, they have trouble to understand it. This is another example, and this is the museum that, uh, whose um, architectural patterns were taken by the major of the place where I work, and they almost copied it. So I was kind of uh, angry with this situation. It's also here in this area. And this is run by different um, organizations. It's academics and also the government and also the community, but mainly it's run by the academics. So also the decisions on what to share were taken by the archaeologists and they show archaeology and they show the vessels and the things they find. But this is my jewel, what I want to, and I'm going to read it because I think it's more, um, more on ideas what I want to show you. This is the Intiquilia Museum. And this is a discoverer also that I made while traveling and driving. And I stopped there and I said, I want to see this. And I think it's part also of the ideas that made me change in how to make a community museum or help to make it. So Intiquilia Museum is a, a, it's independent from official and professional discourses, as well as its decidedly indigenous stance. The Intiquilia Museum forms a clear contrast with other museums in the region. Heritage practices embrace the region's long-term history of mixing and recombination of both people and materials. And the museum in Tikija has gained our attention due to this unprecedented dynamism and originality. It was created through the will and vision of a local resident who decided to exhibit his sold collection in his house without any kind of academic or government participation. The idea of the museum came after what the owner narrates as a miraculous encounter with an ancestor that he experienced while working in the fields as a child. But the actual collecting project started after a great upheaval caused by a mudslide, locally called a volcan, uh, running water and, and earth, in, that buried most of the town. When the rains came and washed out the ground, uh, artifacts began to emerge and called him to assemble them in a local collection. Since then, the owner's vision had become that of a museum that is run by his family, but conceived as an indigenous community museum. The museum does not charge for visits, accepting only voluntary contributions. In various informal interviews and conversations, the owner and his son have told us that they wanted a museum of everything, not just old pots. And 
other things that all of them should be touched, could be touched. Uh, just, just to tell you, this is a very, um, how can we say, this piece, uh, archaeological uh, sculpture, is very rare. Uh, if you put it in the, in the market, it's very expensive. You can send it and sell it uh, to Europe. But they stand it there without any um, uh, security or whatever. They know it's valuable, but it's there. Um, the museum is more interesting than others in the region, in the wars, because it shows things that the Indians, but also the old people. For example, their grandparents and everything else. This collection of artifacts involves all kinds of obje objects and materials, from typical archaeological artifacts to items that would not normally be included in a category. The pot of his grandmother used it for cooking, bark nose, reflecting the various changes in the national currency, etc. The flag, well, you can see. People from the local area and elsewhere started bringing donations and the museum now has an interesting assemblage of diverse origin. Rare and highly valuable archaeological sculptures are not exhibited uh, anymore as being more important than other ordinary artifacts, such as old irons, everyday pots and pans, or even contemporary plastic objects. Many of the archaeological artifacts are also intervened. I think this next one. Going to show. I'm going to go back, but just, okay, this is the intervention of archaeological artifacts, okay? Um, they are painted, decorated, and incorporated into the all art projects. These objects are equally valuable as presenters in the sense of both introducers and facilitators of presencing of both the community and the community members' life stages and relationship with the place. So this is a museum of life in their community, understood as a network of relationships in space and time. This family is part of what has a recent year become the Comunidad Indígena Ingamana, which is actively involved in demonstrations rejecting the open mining projects in the region. This reemergence cannot be separated from Union de Aguita activism and from Quilmes itself as a node pulling in forces and radiating its influence beyond its boundaries. So much so that they have conducted re-treatments of Quilmes exodus in their own local public festivals. The Ingamanas reinterpret the Quilmes and construct their own classifications. And in this process, a new assemblage reverses a reverse anthropology, a theory of relational identity instantiated through artifacts. This is the Kilmes representation they are making. And here is where the rhizomatic model of identity can be limited in considered as continuous relationships in space, but at the expense of time. As Weiner has argued, cultural difference is established via the density of inalienable things and places, a density that emerges from the connotation as associations that are attached to think as a consequence of long-term tra trajectories, transactions, and entanglements they experience. At the Intikisha Museum, the juxtaposition of various kinds of materials from the past and present reveals the haunting power that things from the past can possess. They make memories tangible, as well as the need from rearranging these memories in specific ways, in order to make sense not only of the past, but also of the new presence and desired futures of particular localities. The museum is itself in assemblage, manifesting the past-present system that looks inwardly to the place where it sets in its deep time history. But it also casts a wide network of explicit and non-explicit connectors with coexisting social material orders, as well as those that previously existed. 
While the artifact displays emulate those of traditional museums in the invitation to visually read them, the accessibility of things and their arrangements imply alternative aesthetics rules and values, which we can call the aesthetics of the re-emergence. It's Cologne, it's, the, it's here also the, the church, and the family photograph, and, you know. So this is the owner of the, of the museum. So we have to finish. So uh, here we have presented some reflections uh, that have arisen for us in relation to the topic of professional practices in archaeology and anthropology within a context of intercultural management of heritage and territory of northwestern Argentina. Since heritage is a continuous, dynamic construction, it acquires meaning only to the extent that it is associated with spaces, territories that have histories and trajectories. In the cases discussed here, heritage is the form of construction, objects, forms, knowledge, movements, and presence that are linked in order to make up these communities with their conflicts and with their agreements. The social utility of rural museums is a function of the quantity and quality of links that can be established between the present and the past. This value comes when the museum takes into account the local community since its formation and administration from the start, taking a leading role in decision making. The role of the museum should focus on assisting local people to get in touch with their own history, traditions, and values. We seek to respond to the concerns about the preservation of memory and community spaces, also arising from the interaction between the scientific communities, but especially their need to position themselves socially in a globalized world. So once again, this is not a story about how scientific impact or modify local communities and landscapes, but the opposite. It is about how the practice, local society and landscapes impact and modify researches as me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm sure we could take a few questions. If you have any questions, um, I hope Dr. Kristani will address them after she gets her water. Thanks, Rebecca. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're mostly talking about central and northern Argentina? Northern Argentina. North? Yes, nor northwestern Argentina. Okay. I, I have a friend who's a Mapuche. Mm -hmm. His name is Milo Cabrera. You know him? No. Uh, he was he was the leader of the indigenous community here. Mm -hmm. Now he lives in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. But maybe I thought the Mapuches was one of the bigger indigenous tribes there. Do you know much about them? Well, they yes, they are a big tribe and um, big uh, ethnic. But the the difference with them is that they were able to maintain some of their lands and their language and their traditions. So uh, even if they were like uh, forced to be in a part of the territory, they had more tools to 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 um, let's say to fight for their rights because they had maintained this cultural. Uh, heritage. In the cases I have shown, these people were not called Indians for many, many years. I mean, it's just right now this reemergence that make that the other people can believe that they are Indians anymore. So they are quite op quite different situations. And one last thing: uh, How many uh, indigenous people were there before, you know, 500 years ago versus now? 500 years ago, oh, they I mean, were before, before the conquest. Before conquest. Yeah, much more. I mean, um, in Argentina, we we don't have this um, this big uh, disappearances like uh, f by um, enfermedades, uh, yeah, disease. disease. Yeah. We don't we we don't have a record of that, Plus, but we know that. Murder, murder. 
yeah, murder. But, but we know also that one of the big impact on, in social practices and reproduction was this movement that the, the Spaniards made. They, made they, they moved the people from their own place to other places, relocate them, and they make them work you know, as, a, as workers for them. Yeah, kind of slavish. So I think that was the biggest impact that we can, that, that is record, that we know. Missionaries? Missionaries? Oh yeah, there, there were a lot, too. But, yeah, it's, it's a sad story in that way, yeah, like, ev like everywhere. Yes? I'm interested in the uh, uh, people who visit the museum. Hmm. You, for example. You can go. Who? <laughs> <laughs> so, is there to have an idea of who is using the museum? And the local people, certainly. Probably go and watch it. You get visitors from away, from other places? Yes. The museum is in a route, in a principal. Um, yes, in the principal route. Route. It's all right. Yeah, way. In the principal way. Highway. It's not a highway. The principal route is uh, the tierra. So every tourist that passes to Antofagasta de la Sierra, which now is a touristic place, it, this, this land was kind of. Uh, out of everything. It was not in a central marketplace or whatever. So it's very, very far away. It's the far west. But uh, now there are mining projects up, st up in, the, in, the, um, in the highlands and also tourist projects because it's a very beautiful volcano area. So every tourist that goes through the route stops there. And we have their writings. And they, what they say all the time is what they really, really like is the local people explaining their own histories. I mean, showing the, the museum, the guides, showing the museum and explain with happiness and, and fairness what they have. So they all write down that. But we are, we are working hard also to make the school work together with the museum. Because the school is a very authoritative authoritative uh, institution, especially in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And the teachers, uh, at the, the, the maestros at the beginning didn't want to deal with the museum like, oh, you are another thing and we have you know, the school, we are the, the ones that have the, 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 the knowledge. So now uh, we have a becaria uh, that is making a project linking both uh, institutions uh, related with identity. And so now the school is also using the museum and local people too. But it's not that fantastic as we want still. <laughs> we hope it's beginning to be more and more interested because people live very apart. I mean, there's not a population near the museum that can use it. People have their um, um, Place their houses, yeah, up in the mountains. So and they are working all the time. They are rural people. They don't have Saturday, Sunday, or, or feast days. So it's kind of difficult. So now we are planning to do like a mobile museum. That's in Barrancalarca. Yes, it's in Barrancalarca. Yes. Yes, I I, I think you. Sí. Eh, primero que nada, muchas gracias por haber venido y voy a hacer mi pregunta en inglés porque pues, no todos han podido querido este, aprender español. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, is there a role for the rural communitarian uh, museum impacting the political empowerment of people through the idea of creation of identity? Well, we don't know yet. Um, I mean, the museum is made by them, so it's going to impact in them as far as they want to, to make something with that. So, because it's not something from outside, so uh, w we cannot check that. This is kind of related to that. I know uh, in Kilmes there was a fight over the ownership of the land. Mm -hmm. it's, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have landowners and local people who are struggling, and indigenous identity is part of that struggle. Yes. Is it possible that the museum will play a role in that struggle over claiming land rights? We hope so, <laughs> because in, in that way, I mean, we 
we are more on the side of the of the local people because there, there will be this big um, concentration of the lands and they don't have the titles either. I mean, they say they have, but there was a big um, uh, study of the government to see to, to, to put a law and to see whose land is whose. And in that, they found out that the owners of the land don't, don't have peepers either, and they just went there. So we hope that, but we are not part of, the, of that fight. I mean, we, we do not say you should do this or that. We are just looking and we, we hope they, they can arrive to a better solution. But, uh, but Kilmes case is interesting because um, we worked there in that workshop and they wanted to, to have this sacred city, which is the archeological site again, and we were helping in that. But then the government is very interested in that side because it's the uh, emprendimiento, the, um, the business, the biggest business in the valley. The, the entrance of, to go to the archeological site is the biggest business in the valley. More than tomatoes, more than wine, more than anything else. So the government is really interested in that side too. And they wanted to do there a big museum. And the museum that they showed is like, uh, I don't know, for San Francisco, you know, all lights and beautiful and, you know, with a steam and glass and, and uh, technical resources, which has nothing to do with the place. Place is very rural too. So that situation that was imposed by the government, they said, we want you to do this museum, uh, put apart the community. And now they are, they are really in a, very, very horrible fight, also with bullets between them, because of this situation. Yeah. So, in that way, you can <laughs> you can disturb the things, but it's just an impotion again. Yes. What identities do these people think that they're identifying themselves with? The land, the deep land the migration in there, the Bolivians coming in, I mean, the Europeans, the, the people that didn't get taken down to Buenos Aires. That they, one. They're the, they, yeah, they take in that one. Only well, that one. Yes. They're not taking, they're not bringing in that highland Bolivian indigenous. No, no at all. But it's also part of this discursive trap, you know. They, for Argentina law to be an Indian community, they have to inscribe and say, we are this. And they have to be just that. So these are the Indians that went to Buenos Aires, but they survived. And people say, no, you, you couldn't survive. They were all taken. And they say, no, some of us went to the mountain and we were hidden. Yeah. 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 So that, that's what they say. We were hidden and we are the brave killers that, so, yes, yes. We don't know if they really came Well, no, did, they maybe, maybe some, maybe some were hidden, who knows, but. Most are Bolivian people. Most of them, because of the la of the last names, yeah. most of them are Bolivians that came to work That's in the what haciendas. I was thinking, whether they were doing a pan Andean, but they don't, but they don't identify with that. So Ma Mariette knows also what. But some, uh, not the one that were taken to, to Buenos Aires, but came from Kings, but mm -hmm. from the other side, for example, there was a big. Yes, right. sure. Some then they were taken to Tucumán and, they, and those in returned. The colonial period, they were mm -hmm. taken back. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to return. Yes. To the Some, back. But not the kilns. Yeah. 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 And they, they came people during the colonial period to from Chile, from Atacama. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there's also a, a researcher, a historical research, uh, it's called uh, Lorena Rodriguez, that had made a, 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 a study from, from the local people right now, their origins, where they come in, and what that. And yeah, it's that. It's the same people that it was there, plus these Bolivian workers that came, but they don't, they don't speak Aymar. I mean, it's a long, long history. Sure. They are not. Yeah, several hundred years. Yes, yes. So. They, in, in, 
Ah. How do the, the people in Barranca Largas to get, get the idea of the museum? The ah. I think we, you. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I didn't say you should do a museum, never ever, but I was working there for 20 years, and but when they what asked the me, idea of the, the they didn't have any idea. I mean, that, that's interesting because I was working there for 20 years. In 20 years, I was talking with a lot of people. Maybe because you and were what do you do, Alejandro? What do you do? Well, I study the history of this place and the, your ancestors and how the, you know all the stuff we always say. So, and they ask me many times, and where do you put that knowledge? And say, so, well, you can write a book or you can do a museum. That's, that's yeah. all the thing. But it seemed I was very proud because I didn't say them ever to the museum, but we were working with Laura Quiroga, which is another researcher, going house by house, asking them what, what do they think we should ask, we should do to help the community besides bringing archaeological knowledge. And they put all these other ideas, the chucheria and the senderos, all the things that as archaeologists or social scientists we can do. But the idea of museum was uh, an assembly, assemblea? Assemblea? Assembly? Uh, with the major of the community and the major. We were not there and we did not it was going to happen because they had to use the money from the mining, from the mining. And it can be used only in a building. They cannot use for other things. So what kind of building do you have for the community? And they agree and they say, we want a museum. And that's what the major made that building that we don't tower. like, the tower, yeah. Some of them must have, well, maybe not, had, had gone, had visited other museums. Mm -hmm. They knew what they were. They no idea. idea what to expect. No, no. just with us. Afterwards, we, okay. we, we brought them. And, and we also helped to make connections with those other familiar museums and that, put them in a net to work together and that. But no, no, they, they didn't. That's why it was so difficult for them to say, oh, we have to decide, you know? And they wanted us. Oh, then you do the museum. No, no, we're not going to do the museum. You wanted the museum? You do the museum. <laughs> yeah. It was, the, yeah. Oh, um. Yeah, I worked with the Native Americans for many years, and I'm just curious, among Indian nations in, in, in North America, there's many similarities. Like, um, for instance, um, lots of Native tribes have what's called the Bear Clan, and the Bear Clan are, are women who choose the chief. And if the chief, if the chief misbehaves, they can replace him. Um, so women have a lot of, you know, Power. more of a voice. Also, they thought seven generations ahead whenever they made decisions, and they referred to pe animals as animal people, plants as plant people. They, there was more of an equality with all, of, you know, nature. Hmm. Is it similar there? Uh, no, not anymore. Right no. Before. Oh. It, well, we don't know because. Um, because they Christians. Yes, they are Christians right now, yeah. But also because the Spaniards didn't leave a good record as chronicles or something like that, we can study to see how it was working before. But now, but now no, women are not empowered at all. And, uh, and they are Catholics, yeah. And they are Argentinians. They don't say they are Indians. There's no record of the past? Very, I mean, no. Let's say comparing with Peru and with other places in northwestern Argentina was kind of a far west, so there's a little. Resisted the Spaniards for over 100 years. Also, that, yeah. That's why over 100 years they resisted the, uh, the Spaniards, and um, that was why they took them so far away. They, they the killed us. They were the one that resisted over 130 years. And, but all the other peoples and tribes in the valley were taken away from there. For, that was the only way they could dominate them. Yeah, but also when they made the, the first entrances and that, the description of the area is very it's poor yes. comparing with other places. They were not really and interested. It's a different situation south in Argentina because 
in, in the southern part of Argentina is more like in the plains here or yes I think with the Mapuche with the Mapuche with the Mapuche yeah, they still have their own land yeah, yeah. it's different and they the Mapuche have had a you say yeah, language the, yes. and their religion. And there the women are very powerful. Yes. 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 Because and they and they also have this they nature, were, yes. Were there pictographs like on the stone on the walls, no paintings? Yeah. Yes. 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 Lots and lots. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So they could be interpreted. No. No? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Um, I have been involved in a version of this, but in Bolivia, and they very much wanted a museum. It was kind of a slightly different tilt on the pressure. They were very keen, this community really wanted a, their own museum for their heritage and for their children. Yeah. So that, that, that it was different. They didn't have the money to build it. They had, as opposed to having money and what do we do with it, it was, we really, really want this. So the archaeologists helped them with that. And what we primarily did was try and get the money to buy the estuco and the cement and you know, the things that you really needed to bring in besides the adobes. But their desire for having a museum was because they thought that was going to bring them tourism mm -hmm. and money. So and they wanted it for the children. Of course, many people had different ideas, but there was this sense of we'll be part of the network. Yeah. And so I'm wondering how much your communities thought they'd be part of this ruta turistica kind of thing. The, it's yes. part of, yeah, it's part of, and we do yeah. we do not deny that, and we hope in that. They know about it. They know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. That sure, be a place sure, on the sure. And I think when they said, oh, you do it, it's yeah. because they said, you, you know how to do it for the tourists, yeah. you know? And when we said, no, we're not working only for the tourists, we are not interested. If you want to do it for the tourists, you can go ahead. And then, so it was, Sebastian was there at that time. I mean, it was a big meeting with the people and we were talking about that. And it was very complicated because in, in a moment, we archeologists didn't know what to do. I mean, we have all this, all this group, big, huge group, well, huge, big group for the, for the community. It was good. And, and they were just looking at us and, you, you tell us what to do, <laughs> and we say, you know. But once, what, but once they started to understand that it, it was their own uh, uh, need and whatever, they were really happy. I mean, we, we, we got nice things. And finally, you saw the photos, it's not that different. I mean, they just choose to put it in that way and it's not, because they, and this is the point, they want to be part of the modern, Yes. It's a link, it's a link. Sure, to sure. Mom. They don't want to show their old kitchen, no. in the kitchen, dirty with uh, the rats. They don't want to show that. They want to show the, the good part, and the modern part. In Antofagasta, they want to show their mummies, yes. for example. Yes. They want to show yes. their mummies. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or their ancestors. Their, their, their heritage, their, their deep heritage. The yeah. Yes, exactly. yeah, and interesting, they are the ones that put the, the, the Sobel, the problem were the archaeologists. Two groups of archaeologists, one saying the community won, and the other saying no, because they are colonized, colonized and so they don't know, you know. But they, they had no problem. They wanted to put the money, yes. Right. Okay. okay. Stop, this is going on. Well, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.